Welcome to the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so you can become who you were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith, and if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share this podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it at jbirdfit. Today, I have a very special guest for you, John Kim, author of Single on Purpose. I used to be a miserable fuck, and it's not me, it's you, also known as the angry therapist on social media. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to just accept the invitation to be yeah, here today. It's really freaking cool, man. You know, it. it's funny because a year ago, I was listening to you on Ed Milet, and I had followed you way before then but you had this you had this moment that was like kind of surreal for you when you first got into his presence because the night before you know you're able to review his content and look through it and yeah yeah check check him out and you were like that wall comes down and then all of a sudden it's like you're in front of this person you have this you can feel his energy his power his presence and just who he is as a person and it's like you can just sense that it was like washing over you in that moment. Like how cool is the internet to be able to bring yeah. so many different people together? So yeah, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, of course. And uh, I always tell people if you ever hear me talking shit about the internet, uh, cause of course there are bad things too. Um, <laughs> yes. Punch, punch me in the face because the internet has uh, um, given me, fuck, it's given me sense of purpose. It's given me, life it's given me a career it's given me <laughs> it's given me so much right uh the wall being down now and being able to access people whether it's via referral or dm or even you know through agents or whatever um it's amazing i mean it's really you know like the 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 idea of a a, a celebrity is dead in that right. um it could be your next door neighbor <laughs> you know <laughs> celebrity i often wonder i'm waiting for my neighbors to catch on to to what I'm doing because they see me with the microphone and the phone and walking around. I ruck every day and I'm constantly recording. I'm sure they're like, this guy is crazy. There's something yeah, wrong with like, him. This guy listens to <laughs> Joe Rogan or he's yeah. doing porn. Ah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I saw that you got a new cold plunge. Yes. How do you like that? Man, I'm, I've become obsessed with it. It has all the ingredients of um, something that is challenging mentally, which I'm drawn to. Uh, it's a challenge physically. Um, and then also, uh, uh, you know, they keep finding more and more health benefits to it. So, um, I just, uh, and and I know it's kind of popular right now. Uh, zero, nothing (laughs) (laughs) to be honest. Just a lot uh, lot of procrastination, hesitation. Yeah. What if we find out at, at, you know, uh, years later that the whole thing is a myth and uh, (laughs) people are spending thousands on these cold plunges and torturing themselves and and for, for no reason. No. Um, the first thing is inflammation. I, uh, I, I try to get into the gym daily. So that's my number one thing is, uh, lowering inflammation. I'm hoping that, uh, metabolism speeds up um at 50 it supposedly helps with testosterone which is huge naturally and then um this i feel for sure this i know exists um just because i feel it so much is uh the 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 about five to ten minutes after when you get out um you really feel like you did cocaine naturally i mean you're it's really hard for me to be upset angry depressed right after a cold plunge because i'm on such a high so the dopamine is real for sure. Yeah. And do you, you do it or have you done it? I, I have done it. Mine currently has a hole in it and I'm in that place oh. of, oh, man, because I, I got one of the troughs, right, from yeah. tractor, tractor supply and yep. then it froze over the winter and then it's been 90 degrees here. So it's whatever. But the, the temperature is getting to the point now where it's like I'll be able to do it regularly. Yeah. And I'm looking at pulling the trigger on the one fancy. that's. <laughs> yeah, but it's like shit. Five thousand dollars ends they're, up being six thousand dollars. I live crazy. in I live in Illinois, so if I yeah. put it outside, there's a high potential if I don't get the hot and cold that it'll crack or there'll be some sort of issue. Oh, so, right, right, right. Um, yeah, they're astronomical. I luckily yeah. got I got kind of sponsored. Um, I, they gave it to me for free, and it was uh eighty five eighty five hundred dollars, and it took three months. They're custom made from Australia, and I was like, who can afford? I mean, I mean, right that's such a huge investment, but, um, I gotta say, uh, shout out to them. I, it's, it's, I've been using it daily. I have friends coming over my, my, uh, my, my place is now called the John Kim's Korean spa and, uh, <laughs> it's great, man. I'm taking drop-ins. It's great. 
And what's the brand name? I'm not affiliated, Odin. but obviously you are. So yeah, Odin, Odin, O D I N. They're like the Bentley of uh, ice plunges. Uh, I just saw on on Instagram Chris Hemingsworth, mm -hmm. the big hunky action star. He he they, he has one now, and uh, nice. it's really kind of catching on. It seems appropriate, Odin, Thor. Yeah, that's I, that's exactly yeah. yeah it looks that. very yeah. I'd, I'd be uh, begging him if I was Odin to <laughs> please right, right. use our cold plunge and talk about it often. Hey, I love, by the way, uh, it's very like me that uh, you just hit record and we jump right in. Yeah. So I was thinking to myself, wait, are we, are we still doing small talk or are we, are we in it? And I realized- No, we're oh, in shit. it. Yeah, yeah, we're in it. So uh, thank you for displaying, I see my books up on your shelf. That's 100%. very- 100%. Yeah, very I, so this is something that I've taken to doing to try to help people out. I'm in this place of what I've realized for me on social media is collaboration is key. Yeah. And so all of 2020, this didn't exist a year ago. Really, it's been the past six months that I've been able to gain momentum. And in the process, I keep asking people and they keep saying yes. Mm. Occasionally people say no, and that's fine. I get yeah. it. In my mind, I'm just like, well, six months from now, you'll, we'll be having a conversation. It'll happen. That's why I was talking about Ed Milet to begin with, because this is one of those full circle moments for me where it's like, how cool is it that six months ago, this really wasn't a thing. And now all of a sudden, like that momentum got built. I met MC. We mm -hmm. built a, a small friendship mm. and I enjoy our conversations, which brings me up to tiny little joys. What's a tiny little joy that you've experienced <laughs> recently? Um, the I mean, speaking of plunges, that's become definitely uh, a, a, a tiny little joy in my life. Um, my daughter, she's almost four, um, wakes me up in the morning. She's the human alarm clock. So she comes uh, banging through my door and uh uh you know will jump on me or do something and and in that moment and you know of course no one likes to get get woken up but uh something about her jumping on me first thing in the morning is uh definitely tiny a tiny little joy makes me happy and it's one of those things i keep telling people you have to try to find these things in the smallest possible moments in your life yeah. i'm glad that you mentioned it's you can hear the door open Mm -hmm. And then you can feel the presence of the little one in the room. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they're hopping on the bed and you're like, all right, I'm up, I'm here, you know? And it's just yeah. like that moment. If you can hang on to that moment, it's ever so brief. They don't last very long. It's hard to have that moment last any longer than a few seconds, maybe yes. a couple, couple minutes, if you're lucky to appreciate that in the moment, to slow things down and to mm -hmm. allow yourself to experience that as a gift. What, uh, what's one for you most recently? Oh, man, um, because this is my life, it's just the people that I'm able to connect with. I, mm. I had a wonderful podcast episode yesterday with Rick William, and mm. he's just a really good dude, kind, compassionate. And, you know, these conversations, they they fill me up. You know, yeah. I, I don't know if MC shared a portion of my story with you, but I was a police officer for eight years, mm. mm -hmm. uh, crime scene SWAT team and had all these different experiences through that. And wow. the, the reason I'm here is the amount of death that I saw on a regular basis, whether it was um, inflicted by someone else or self-inflicted. Wow. And you begin down this path of personal development, or at least I did, because I needed more information. I didn't understand what was happening. I'm looking at this stuff going, why? Why does this keep happening? Is it something that's preventable? Is there something that my role as a police officer, is there something that I can do through this process to begin to try to understand and then try to mitigate or prevent? So you go down this path of finding all these different books and it led me to attachment. Mm. And I started diving into attachment because a lot of this stuff is going to be relationship related, how we relate to other people, mm -hmm. how people receive us. And more importantly, just the view that we have of our world in our environment yep. and then how that feels to our nervous system there, it sounds like all these little pieces but it's like when you bring them all together it's like ah well well now there's this little package that we can start to develop and work on and bring attention to to begin to help people and it's like you say it's that relationship with yourself how, what um, how do i improve that how did seeing so much death in your life um, affect you? Did, uh, I mean, what was there? Uh, I mean, it, to me, that sounds traumatic, but, uh, yeah. um, did it also lower your quality grade of life? Did, was there a sense of hopelessness? Uh, did work become scary and dreadful? Brother, I don't talk about this very often. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect you question. Know, then. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I've you don't have to, by the way, it's your podcast. No, no, yeah. no, no, absolutely. But it's one of those things. It's just, I, I don't think enough people, you're the type of person that I would have this conversation with. Mm. A lot of people try to enter into this conversation, but they don't have the background, the experience, the knowledge. Yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. they don't know what it's like to walk into a room yeah. where somebody has 
you know, left the planet permanently and then the lack of energy in that room and what it feels mm -hmm. like and the experience and the setup and, you know, the amount of time and effort that was put into trying to figure out, you know, uh, a particular method or route that they were going to take to facilitate this. Yeah. And when you when you package that all together and then you see it in its final stages, then my job is to, to come in and you document, you go through and you take pictures mm. and you dissociate in the moment because yeah. if you allow it to wash over you, you're going to have this like visceral emotional reaction. If yeah. you don't like, you're just not a human being. Like I don't, you know, or you've completely dissociated to the degree where you're not, you no longer feel those types of feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was a high level of just empathy and compassion and, and heartache, especially when um, relatives would arrive. It, it's a mother, a brother, a father, a sister, oh, yeah. an yeah. uncle, and people drop to their knees and they're crying and you can just hear the wail and that sticks with you. Oh God. And, yeah, and it, make, it makes you want to do something about it to, to mm -hmm. figure something out. And hopefully at some point down the road, what I'm creating here is going to lead me down a path to be able to mm. bring people together where we can have this conversation and really start to change it. What was the catalyst for you to um, quit that career and then start this one? Or was it organic? <laughs> uh, it was very organic. I got injured and mm. had bicep surgery along with a neck injury and decided that it was time to make a pivot. This was something that was already kind of boiling in the background. I was thinking about it, trying to figure out how to make it work. What can I do? And it was kind of divine intervention. You get put in this place of, should I stay or should I grow? Mm. And I chose to grow. That meant leaving something that I worked so hard for mm. because I was a chef for 15 years before that. Oh, wow. And Amazing. 2008 economy tanks. I decided I'm going to go back to school. So I started at a junior college, take a job for far less money than I was making because yeah. I was unemployed at that point. And you do. Wait, how, how old were you when you did that? Uh, when I went back to school, I was 32, 33. Oh, wow. Because I went back to school to be a therapist when I was 35. So we were, we're kind of in a similar age range. Where oh, we're yeah. Kind of, yeah. Go back and try to reinvent ourselves. Well, yeah. that's back to your book, right? I used to yeah. be a miserable fuck. Yeah. It's like we, we dive into that story and it's just like that story is so relatable to so many people. Mm. And I hope that you know that. I hope that you realize just the, the impact that you're having because you were willing to put your words down on paper and you do it in such a way that is it's eloquent because it's brief. It's yeah. so easy to understand and comprehend and to let it wash over you and then accept it as a personal truth. Like, yeah, I get that. I resonate with that. I, mm. I can do something with this. This is tangible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I used to I used to think uh, because I don't have a vocabulary, I don't know have any big words that um, <laughs> I was dumb and a C student. But I think uh, same. What I do is I bring things to street level, and so what yeah. happens is I think it throws a wide net, um, which I which I've realized is can can be a good thing, not not a bad thing. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you. So you went so you went from chef, police officer. And then, you know, SWAT, uh, and, all that stuff. In, in the middle of that, I ended up getting a master's degree in oh, wow. threat and response management from the University of Chicago. Man, so busy. So going to school and doing that. Correct. And then uh, hurt your injure, injury and then getting into, is it podcasting your first or is it social media or is it everything? You know, I... I started on TikTok. Oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> I, I, oddly enough, I was a year late to the game. Everybody else started in 2020, and I started in late 2021. And it was a lot of me in my recliner for three months because of my mm. bicep surgery. So I was mm. in this ice pack for several months and just talking about mostly relationship related. And like I said, I'd already fallen into attachment. And I think that's really the root if we can get into that. And what is self-love? to you because I have a self-love challenge and I have my own definition, but I yeah. like, I like the little twist that you put on that. So what, what's your definition on that? Yeah. I've, I've, uh, I've never been a fan of the term self-love because I felt that it was kind of a bumper sticker. And I think that love is a choice. I also think that uh, we love people that we don't like, you know, family members and stuff. And so um, after my divorce, instead of self-love, I asked myself, um, what would it look like to like myself? Because I think like has to be earned. Because I could say all day, uh, you know, I love myself, I love myself, and it could be a mantra, an affirmation, but it's very slippery. And so I said, okay, if I was to like myself, who do I need to become? What are the actions? And so I was like, okay, I need to earn that. 
and starting at just kind of ground zero, no friends, no money, nothing um, with just a blog. Uh, I spent every day doing things to earn my like. And so that was my journey. And so getting to a place where um, I like myself generally, uh, some days I don't, uh, it, to me, that's more powerful than uh, this idea of lo loving myself, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely does. I think it's yeah. important for people to recognize, right? That, yeah, some days it is going to be hard to like yourself. Like yeah. it, it, we get to this place where we think that like healing has to happen. And once I'm healed, I'm healed. And it's like, yeah. well, no, no it's not an island. Yeah, you're always in a state of becoming, and yeah. there, there's a flow to that. And yes. there are going to be those ups and downs. Yes. How did being a screenwriter prepare you for where you're at right now with everything that you do? I was asking, um, and I always ask an open opening question when I run groups and stuff. And yesterday in office hours, the question I asked was, um, what was the best thing that never happened to you? Right? What was the thing that if had happened, you wouldn't be where you're at? Um, Jason's writing this question now because he's going to steal that shit. Jason, <laughs> hell <good>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so uh, the question, and so my answer to that is um, never making it as a screenwriter. Uh, if I had made it as a screenwriter in my uh, late 20s, 30s, if I had sold, you know, a, a few million dollar scripts or whatever and entered that uh, quad in Hollywood, Tinseltown. Um, I think I would be the douchebag at the Ferrari. I think I would be, uh, 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 this is dating myself, an e-true Hollywood story. I think I would yeah, be right. predictable. Um, I know that because I'm impulsive. I'm kind of addictive. I have addic addiction to my family. Um, but because I quote unquote failed, it forced me to uh, go back to school, get my master's, study psychology, and then start living a life where I could uh, instead of exchanging truth for membership, I would live a life that was uh, more inward, more honest. And, uh, and now, listen, I'm a gearhead. It doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with Ferraris. You know, I, I would love to buy a few vintage. I was Porsche just going to ask, did you ever get yeah. one? I know you got a bike, but uh, no, I never got a Ferrari. I'm, I, I'm more, I'm more of a, you know, how they have like Ferrari people and Porsche people. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm more of a, I'm more of a 911 guy. But um, I, I definitely would. Uh, be still chasing shiny things, if if you know if you will, and living a life that's more outside in instead of inside out. Um, so yeah, that uh, that uh, 10, 15 years of starting with nothing, changing careers, um, that was prescribed for me. And and then what I take away because I really believe that all parts of our story will be used. Um, it's a choice, but that that helps me tremendously because if not, I'm busy trying to rip out chapters. Um, I don't really believe I failed as a screenwriter. I think that the 10 years of writing screenplays and, and uh, you know, I would do it diligently because I didn't have a life um, and I was desperate. So it actually laid the tracks for me as an author because I, I'm known to write very fast. And so um, when I was uh, a screenwriter sitting at Starbucks writing 10 hours a day, that like – it's like the whole, you know, Bruce Lee, uh, the uh, – the Mal either the Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours or Bruce Lee's 1,000 kicks, right. um, just the reps of writing and writing and writing was my, my, at my school and my training. And so when I started getting book deals, it, it just, you know, or, or actually before then, when I started blogging, you know, and I've written maybe 5,000 blog posts, it, it just came naturally because I was just so used to that as a way of life. And so that that's what I think that chapter of my life was meant meant to be. You're working on a new book now, aren't you? Mm -hmm. What's yep. that going to be about? Uh, this one's all about uh, surviving your breakup. This is all about um, yes, yeah. It's it's about you know I wrote this book called Single on Purpose, and uh, and um, I realized through that and all the comments and stuff, uh, so many people even before being single on purpose, um, they're going through an expired relationship. So. I was like, oh, I, I gotta, I gotta write a book about uh, about breakups, and then my publisher was, yeah, that's a no brainer. Let's let's do it. So I just finished it. That's awesome. When's when's that due out? It takes like a, it depends, but it, you know, writing a book and going through a publisher and then it, it it coming out on shelves takes roughly like a year. It's very similar to kind of like the movie process. You know, you turn it in, it goes through editing. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Um, coming up, teams coming up with the cover, which is my favorite part, right? Seeing right. the poster and uh marketing and all that um it's exciting but it takes about the whole thing takes about a year so it should be out next year sometime 
that's going to be huge. Uh, you know, like I said, you can dive into anybody's comment section that talks on this stuff and get all the inspiration that you need for something like that. People are, they're hurting and they're struggling and they, they're in this place where they get into these relationships, but then they think it's the only relationship. And so yeah. that's something that you talk about yeah. a lot is the one, how has that shaped us in our relationships and, and how we interact with other people, that idea of the one. Yeah, I think it's dangerous. I think the idea that there's only one person for you to um, be with in this world um, makes you narrow. It also puts a lot of pressure on that one person or the relationship. Um, and also what it does is if things aren't going well, instead of really working on your relationship, it kind of gives you an escape door. Because then you say, oh, you're not the one. My one is out there because we're not getting along instead of – you know, getting rolling up your sleeves and working on the on the relationship, you know, relationships are built. And uh, I think that love really uh, doesn't happen until things get hard, you know. But how do we know when to stay? Or when to go? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a process. I think that's a, a that's a it's, it's different for every individual. I, I can't give you like a, a one fits all answer to that. There's so many sure. different factors. Uh, but the generally uh, the general rule I say is if you've done everything you can and you got to be honest with yourself, you know, including therapy and, and really um, owning your piece and your patterns and all that. Uh, and you realize that now you're starting to break up with you. So now the relationship, that container slash partner, um, maybe the alignment is off. Maybe you guys are outgrowing. Whatever is happening uh, now, you are starting to compromise self. And so I think when that happens, uh, maybe the relationship has expired and it was only meant to go as far as it was meant to go. What would you say to somebody who's waiting for a particular relationship to come back? Oh, I don't think uh, I think the life is too short to. Well, when people um, try to do round twos, round threes or give something a, a second shot, um, most most of that doesn't work out because I think two people has to experience secondary change secondary change is change that's not reversible right um that you you are now a different person um your cells are different the way that you see the world is different the way you maneuver in relationships are different so if two people are different and has gone they've gone through some kind of journey then there is a chance because uh, even though you may look the same uh the relationship dynamic will be different but if people just got haircuts or abs or it's been a while and you just, you know, missed the sex or whatever it is, um, the same things that broke up the relationship are still there because they weren't addressed and they're probably going to still be there. You know, uh, this isn't for everyone, not 100 percent. I'm sure I'm right. sure I'm sure a lot of people have gave it a second shot. And, and for some reason it worked out. I don't know. Um, but I would consider those outliers. Probably. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for yeah. sure, and, and maybe, maybe it was maybe what those relationships needed was time and space, and then when people came back, um, they were wiser. They they noticed more. They did, they were now ready to do some work. Who knows? You know. So, yeah, and, and some yeah. circumstances where that might happen is you know somebody had a death in the family, or they're going through some sort of personal yeah, struggle that maybe sure. they haven't articulated or communicated, and they're they can't give to the relationship at that time. Now, ideally, you know, if we're all healed people running around, then yes, you're able to work through that. But not all of us can do that when we're in a place of, of struggle. We haven't developed that resilience yet. So the, the mm -hmm. path is I got to step back. I got to let go. And then, you know, six months, a year down the road, things have changed. And, you know, now you can kind of dive back into that and see if it's something that you want to get into. Yeah. I also say ask for therapy receipts, but there's always that. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to be a man? Oh, man, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that definition is a moving target. I think, yeah. I mean, you know, like even, you know, meeting you and hearing your story. Um, I mean, you know, you, you have such um, a diverse story from, you know, uh, chef to police to. Uh, I, I, ca I call it chronic resilience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and, 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 and I, I think you have a um it seems like you have a um a good combination of both masculine and feminine energy. Um, you know, of course you physically very masculine, but also uh someone who is reflective and on this journey. Um I think my simple I mean, I always try to simplify. Sometimes it 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 uh it's I'm simplifying too much, but uh I started 
by saying my definition of man, and this ties to my story, is uh, someone who responds instead of reacts because most of my life I was a walking reaction. Uh, my dad didn't have the ability to respond. He was always reactive. So I, I although I loved him, um, I didn't see him as a man. I kind of saw him as a man child. Uh, he was also an alcoholic. So being the adult, me being an adult child of an alcoholic, I saw a lot of that in me, a lot of reacting. And it wasn't until my divorce and realizing that I am a walking reaction uh, and starting to learn how to respond. Um, that's when I started crossing the great divide from boy to man, I think, you know? And so uh, to me, that's kind of number one is if you have the ability to respond instead of react. Um, I mean, I don't think that's the only thing, <laughs> but that's the beginning of, I think, uh, going from boy to man. Right. Well, in your book, I used to be a miserable fuck. We're in this place where we're emotionally immature. We're underdeveloped. Yeah. And being able to cultivate enough self-awareness to recognize some of those patterns in yourself, that's like that's gold if you can do that. If you can just get to a place where you can start to see, and it might just happen. You're, it's what happened to me. I'm driving down the roadway. I got my truck windows down, and it's a nice day out. The sun's out. It's just perfect. The, the radio's off, and I'm in this state of silence, and then all of a sudden it hits me. I'm the common denominator in all my life's problems. I should probably do something about this. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't something that I had really contemplated before, but it just hit me that something's got to change. There's a shift that has to happen. It was this yeah. inner knowing that came from deep down here. And I'm like, it's time. I, I got to change this. And so if you can cultivate that self-awareness, it, it's just a huge step in your personal development and self-discovery journey. Yeah. And the, um, the uh, emotional um, un uh, unawareness, uh, the reactiveness, the iron fist, the suppressing feelings, the addictions, those are all kind of um, – the result or the ripple of something that's happening inside, which is maybe a disconnection with self, um, old wounds, uh, you know, like other things that are, that are deeper. So it's not just about fixing behaviors because that can be more of a bandaid, um, mm -hmm. but really exploring um, your relationship with self. Uh, you know, lately I've been doing a lot of um, learning how to self soothe, uh, reparent, rewire like these kind of words to me live under the surface and uh they're going to um shape you and grow you and you know uh, addressing old wounds you know that kind of stuff yeah. um i think that's the real work not just okay i gotta take a beat before um or or i'm gonna you know chase this guy who cut me off and you yeah know. <laughs> let's um, let's not do that yeah i mean that's helpful too that's more like i think that's on the surface that's just as important um, but on top of that, I think, um, we, we do need to go deeper, follow the string down. Where do these things come from and why, um, how have you been hurt? What trauma have you been through? Like that, that kind of stuff. I, I love that you use that as an example, because the interview I had yesterday said the same thing, chasing a guy down. <laughs> it was like, Oh really? Yeah. It was a <laughs> Did he also live in Los Angeles? Maybe. That's uh, no, um, <laughs> Costa Rica, I think, but yeah. you just, you catch yourself and you realize, yeah, this isn't good. I yeah. should probably not be doing this. And where does this even come from? Why am I doing this? I don't get it. What does self-soothing look like for you now that you started to dive into that? Uh, coconut oil on a Friday night. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, self-soothing. That was a boy. That was the boy. In me coming <laughs> that was out a 13 year old. It's yeah. like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you know what? I, I let that 13 year old say what he wants to say once in a while. Very, Hell yeah. you know, I, uh, I took, I did a video of uh, me tanning my taint, which is also, <laughs> I was going to mention that. Yeah. <laughs> and I also lost like, I also lost like 2000 followers. Yeah. And, um, anyway, uh, self-soothing to me is, uh, I, uh, I, I think in relationships is when it's the hardest. Um, so I tend to swing toward an anxious, uh, attachment style. So self-soothing to me, is uh, not putting my needs on my partner, but uh, sometimes taking care of myself, my anxiety, my, you know, uh, not depending on my partner to calm my nervous system or reduce my anxiety or uh, love me in a very specific way. Um, instead, self soothe. So, for example, if I, uh, um, you know, feel like I need compliments or I, I, I feel like I need um, to be desired. Um, 
that's a legit need. But sometimes uh, if I'm needing that every single day and I'm grabbing my partner for that, um, maybe there's some self-soothing. Maybe it's coming from a place where it's my responsibility to look at what's lacking instead of um, demanding or wanting from my partner, if that makes sense. It absolutely does. And it's that runner chaser dynamic that often gets created with the, the anxious and avoidant. And it mm -hmm. pops up so much in the comments that I receive. You know, I went on a vacation with my partner. There was this, it was great for like the first three days. By the fourth day, things kind of blew up or like things got really silent. And then by the time we got home, they bolted. I didn't see them for two weeks after that. What's happening when that situation happens and how can I begin to navigate that? especially without taking it personally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a journey. Uh, it's a practice. Um, but self-soothing and kind of reparenting, I think is, uh, you know, th those kind of go hand in hand, reparenting yourself, uh, be being there for yourself emotionally. Uh, and of course, you know, if you're with in a relationship, it's uh, your, your partner should also uh, support and champion, but um not at the risk of them losing them their, their sense of self, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, what, is it's hard. what does reparenting look like for you? I think for me, um, I grew up uh, uh, in a Korean family where a uh, small family, just uh, 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 two sons and two, uh, two and parents, uh, they were always at work. And so um, my parents never taught me um, anything. I mean, they just wanted me to study and get A's because that would lead to success. Uh, they didn't teach me how to make my bed. They didn't teach me how to do dishes. My mom did everything for me. Um, so when I was when I was 35, I got divorced and found a roommate on Craigslist. Uh, I remember doing the dishes and I poured dishwashing soap. I didn't know that 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 the dishwashing machine had had its own different type of soap. Uh -huh. So I poured I poured dishwashing soap. He came home and the and there were suds everywhere, flooded. Yeah. He he luckily thought it was kind of funny and cute, but uh, um, that's kind of a simple example of. Um, just me kind of being an adult child and then relearning all the just the basics, man, reparenting myself in what it means to be an adult, you know? So yeah. that's kind of behavior, but also emotionally, I didn't get a lot, a lot of emotional milk. Um, no one said to me, you're a good kid or, you know, <laughs> it was right. always, you know, go, you got to be, go get an A. Uh, I, I was driving home yesterday and I got emotional because I was thinking, I was thinking about my own daughter and I had this thought. I said, um, I can't wait. I don't know where this came up, but it came out of, but I, I, I thought of her, you know, uh, when she's older, you know, maybe teens, maybe twenties. And I couldn't wait to tell her one day that, um, I really love who you've become. Yeah. I really love who, who you've become. And, uh, then I, then I thought, Oh my God, what if my parents said that to me? You know, even today as a 50 year old man, like, I don't even think my mom doesn't even know what I know what I do, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, what if they said that to me? And I sat that sat with that and I was like, God, that would feel amazing. Not, I don't like, uh, not, I like, you know, how many books you've sold or what you've done or the scoreboard or whatever. Right. I like your, 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 your motorcycle, your house, but like, I really love who you've become. And I just sat there like, Oh God, every, every person needs to hear that. And so, um, my point in saying this is giving yourself that, giving yourself that, that you really like who you've become, you know, to me, that's reparenting because our, most of our parents have not said that to us. Yeah. Getting that, that one phrase, I'm proud of you. Yeah, of right? course that too. I, yeah. I respect yeah. you. I yeah. respect the person you've become. Oh, yeah. My dad yeah. and I had this amazing opportunity when I got injured. I, didn't have anybody to help me. My German shepherd's not going to, you know, make my food for me and stuff like that. Cause after surgery, I was unable to do a whole bunch of stuff one handed. And we had mm. this opportunity to re to connect in ways that we hadn't before. Cause oftentimes your parents have this version of you in their head. Mm. You left the house and that's the version that kind of sticks with them. Mm. And then there's all these little moments throughout time that get intermingled with that. But the, the core belief is that you're still kind of this 19 year old, that mm -hmm. left the house and, you know, we've had all these small experiences and uh, we had all these amazing conversations and he, he let it out. He's like, I am so proud of the man you've become and just your thought process and how you see the world. And it was just like, <laughs> you know, wow. Like, Wait, what got him to the point to say that? 
Uh, well, cause uh, a lot of, say, it was a lot of tough conversations. You yeah, look at all the yeah. books behind me and you know, that's my thought process and I'm very much entrenched in learning and growing and expanding and reparenting and trying to become this version of me. There's that gap of who I am now and who I want to become. And there's a bunch of skills that I haven't learned yet in order to become this person. But prior to that, I didn't learn the skills that I needed to be an adult, at least not to the degree that would have made me more successful at an earlier age, right? I, I've always had to do things the hard way. And that's I'm thankful because it led me here and I get to do this kind of stuff. But at the same time, it would have been great to learn this stuff a lot earlier instead of having to do it all the hard way. But that's my fault. I'm, I'm a hard head when it comes to a lot of stuff. So I also believe that, uh, you know, we take in what we take in. We learn what we learn when we're, when we're meant to. I don't know if it was be be earlier, if it's possible to be earlier because we were different and we, we weren't able right. to absorb, you know. Um, I wasn't meant to have a child any earlier, man. And I know right. that, uh, you know, I know that I'm going to be like in my sixties and uh, she's in high school and she's, and her friends are like, uh, uh, Logan, your grandpa's here. And I'm going to have uh, white hair. I'll still be rocking, you know, a Harley and, and maybe, you know, yeah, but dude, you're in great shape. You work out every <laughs> yeah. day. Like yeah. we're not going to age like our parents did. That's not right. Happening. Right. But I, 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 uh, in my thirties or, I mean, you know, people have had kids obviously in their twenties. Oh man, I would have been horrible. I would have been horrible. I just, I didn't have the capacity. I didn't have the tools. I would have definitely been reactive. I wouldn't have been present. I would have been, you know, uh, like, you know, most, most of the fathers in oh, this world. It, it would have been a continuation absent. of a cycle. Yes, yes, yes. And right. I think by waiting and having a child uh, now, uh, I think I had her when I was in my, uh, I think 47, uh, definitely, you know, have a higher chance of me breaking the uh, generational transmission process. You know, it stops here yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you're giving me hope because I'm 45 and I've never oh, been married, young. never been married, don't yeah. have kids. Mm -hmm. But I feel like what I'm doing is going to put me in the presence of the sure. type, the type of person that can meet me where I am mm. now. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, we, you choose each and every day to be with that person and to, and to make that work. You want you want kids? Oh, absolutely. I've always oh. wanted, I've always wanted kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just I've never been the person that I needed to be in order yeah. to have in order to have them. Yeah. And it's taken me to get to this point to really take ownership of that and accept that. Yeah. About myself. So what does vulnerability look like and mean to you? There, there's a lot of definitions popping around and it makes people yeah. feel a, a certain way, but how would you present that? I would say showing your solid self. Um, we all have a pseudo side and a solid side. And I pulled from my pseudo. Pseudo is the, um, the one that's, you know, uh, seeks validation approval that lives outside in. So my twenties and thirties, most of my thirties was very pseudo. Uh, and when you're in your pseudo self, your potential goes down, no stars line up and you're just, you know, swimming in your own shit, um, happening to me, that kind of thing. Yeah. It could be victim yeah. mode. It could be, it, it just, uh, I think you're kind of existing, not living right. Um, your solid self, I think is your authentic self. And that's usually the quiet whisper that we don't listen to until we have to right? until something real, you know, until, you know, we lose our kids or go through a divorce or something happens to us. Um, but I think in our solid self is authenticity, it's vulnerability, uh, it's really living in a way where we are showing ourselves, showing our true self. Now, it doesn't mean vomiting. It doesn't mean – because there's a responsibility in being vulnerable, right. right? We're not just vomiting constantly how we feel to everyone. That, that can be narcissistic. Um, I think it's showing who we are and showing up in a way that's honest um, as much as we can, yeah. Why is it that we don't listen to that internal voice, that that little thing that's popping up inside telling us what to do? So I think we do listen when we're young, you know, because I remember at 10 years old, the 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 solid stuff was loud and uh, windbreaker, fat laces, 80 spinning on my head, uh, losing myself in flow states, man. I was so happy. I was a part of a little breakdance crew and they were older. So I felt very protected and safe in the world. Many I love this. <laughs> dude, man, for many people, the 80s was a nightmare. I get it. But for me. I love uh, it. Parachute pants. And, yeah. Parachute yeah pants back to the future. Just, give it to me. Dude, it was great. And yeah. so um, I, I remember at that time, my solid self was very loud 
And then I grew up and realized that, you know, I was the runt. I couldn't get girls. I had crooked teeth, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you have to get a job, you pay taxes. So as you grow up, um, you start then pulling from your pseudo instead of your solid to fit in, to be liked, to, you know, all the stuff. And then um, by the time you're in your 20s and, 20s and 30s, you've really disconnected. And, and this is uh, why that voice that was so loud is now a whisper because you have not practiced listening to it, right? And then we go through a rebirth and then something like a divorce or something, career change, something happens. Um, and then we're like, fuck it. It's, I'm, Time is time is running out. Life is short. I'm going to start listening to my solid self. And when you do that, you also get pushback. You know, people aren't used to <laughs> yeah. this voice. Um, so you lose some friends, you, you know, all of that. Um, but I think then your potential goes up. And then I think when you are in your solid self, um, you make the most you make the most um, the biggest dent, you know, bef before you go on this planet, because uh, your uniqueness lives in your solid self, not your pseudo. Right. Pseudo is just uh, bland it's vanilla. What that brings up for me is very much the same way, because you're in that place of curiosity when mm -hmm. you're young for yeah. life really starts happening to you. Yeah. And then you're in this joyful state. It's just natural joy. You're happy. Yeah. To, you don't know anything different. You're just happy yeah. to be playing in the ditch with your cars, with your matchbox cars, right? right, just right. Hanging out, doing yeah. whatever. And, and then life kind of happens. People start telling you who they think you are to them. And then you make this conscious choice to believe that. Yeah. And you get this overarching theme of I'm not enough or mm -hmm. I'm too much. So I have to play small. I have to be small. I can't be myself. I can't show up authentically because it apparently causes other people pain if I show up authentically. Yeah. That's a hard yeah. place to be, man. It's interesting. It's sad, you know, yeah. um, but there is a happy ending in that Carl Jung talks about the afternoon of life. Um, and I think I'm definitely uh, entering it or I'm in it now. Um, there is something organic and natural as you get older where you just get so tired of um, walking with a mask that it, it kind of falls. It's loose. It kind of falls off on its own. <laughs> right. Uh, unless you're so caught up or you're so, I mean, I don't know. I can't, I can't, I, I like, I feel for like, you know, movie stars or people who are, uh, have so much money that they've never been said no to. I think, I think if, if you live a life like that, it's, it's harder to be. You know, it's like you're almost in, in created your own prison in a way. How has social media impacted your life? Man, it's given me one. It's given me a life uh, just because it's given me a megaphone um, to practice being in my solid self. And and then so it's given me, you know, book deals and a community and a practice and opportunities to be of service. Um, it's given me all that. So, yeah, it's given me a life. <laughs> I didn't have a life before social media. Which is kind of sad. I, I don't. I don't mean it that way. Uh, but it, it, as a tool, as a tool, social media yeah. has given me a voice. It's given me um, 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 something to stand on. Yeah. And what did that shift look like going from blogging into producing social media content? And do you oversee your social media yourself, or do you have somebody that does? Yeah, that I, I do. I do everything myself. Um, and. Uh, it was, I got lucky because I started on Tumblr and I think on Tumblr, um, I didn't think anyone would read it, but I just created a blog called Angry Therapist. I thought it was funny that a therapist was angry. I started documenting and uh, I think I got like 60,000 followers or something. And then, so when social media was invented, um, I think it was Facebook first and then Instagram, I was able to take uh, that audience and start kind of pouring them into social. Um, so I started off, you know, I did I, I mean, I did start off with zero, but I already had some traction from a blog. Uh, so that was, and then I also had the, um, the, uh, uh, the, by the way, there's, um, I apologize for the noise in the background. Oh shit. Now it's bad. Um, <laughs> You're good. The, my gardeners are here. This is, this is why I said 45 minutes. I knew it was Right. Good. No, I hear you just fine, yeah. man. You're good. But, um, uh, yeah, they got blowers out. It looks like ghostbusters outside my. Out my window. Hey, all these '80s references and and people are listening. Like, what the fuck are these guys talking about? Uh, if you watch my social media, I use all '80s music. Oh, I've got, okay, I've got yeah, an '84 yeah. Camaro yeah. in the garage. Like, we this is what we do. It's cool. Our solid so tapping into our connecting to the part of us. Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so Tumblr, 
uh, around 60,000 readers uh, and then a percentage of them flowing into uh, Facebook and then Instagram. So um, I had a little bit of a runway, which was nice. What do you want your legacy to be from all of this? Oh, your, your 85 year old self looking back on on all of this, you know, what do you hope to accomplish in that time? Um, you know what I love the most actually isn't social media is podcasting is what you're doing right now. Yeah. I love the idea of having these audio time capsules and leaving that behind. And, you know, I'm like, I think seven or 800 episodes in. Yeah, you're, I, I, You've honed your craft. You're good at it. Well, they're, they're little micro. The podcast yeah. is, is literally 10 minutes, but it's three times a week. And, um, I want to live, I want to leave here and I want people to think, uh, whether you like me or not, he lived an honest life that like, to me, that's the highest compliment is that I lived an honest life. Um, and honest includes messy. It includes contradictions. It includes being wrong, uh, you know, all over the place, but you know what, man, he was honest with himself. Oh, look at this band -Aid. How do you know your dad? <laughs> I have a My Little Pony band -Aid, I just realized on my forum. Uh, I, I just want to live an honest life. That, that's, yeah. that's, uh, I think that's, what can someone, what can anyone say about that? You know? I said, and it includes showing your perineum on social media. Yes. Yes. <laughs> sometimes that, sometimes My Little Pony Band-Aids. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's being authentic to, yeah. to who you really are and, yeah. and what you resonate with. And, yeah. And it changes, know, but to always be honest. Yeah, there's going to be people that agree with you, disagree with you. And that's just, oh, yeah. that's oh, life, yeah. man. You know, yeah. I, I appreciate your authenticity and, and everything that you bring to us through your podcast, through your books. And I'm glad that you share your experiences with all of us so that we oh, can learn you. and grow from that. Thank you for having um, me on your show. I really appreciate it. For sure. I, I want to make sure that we touch on this. Uh, you've got a retreat coming up and then you also have Lumia coaching. So can you explain those two things to us? Yeah. Uh, Lumia coaching is something I... Uh, created uh co-founded uh, many years ago after being frustrated with the clinical world and uh you could check that out on lumia just you know social media lumia coaching and um i've been running these retreats that i've been falling in love with uh, just super quick week weekend retreats in idlewild and uh, i'm doing my first uh trauma edition i call them uh, miserable fucks retreats with uh, our mutual friend mc yeah. and uh yeah it's just a weekend in the wild with uh, ice plunges and guided walks and processing and a chef and breath work and and it's a uh, it's a reset a quick reset i love that yeah it sounds like a freaking amazing time so if you guys have the time and the opportunity it is october 6th through the 8th yeah I the think. next one's october 6th through the 8th and uh Hey, maybe you can join us one that one time. I would love to. That'd be yeah. amazing. Awesome. For sure. Well, John, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate you. You're welcome. Be well.